I am Anand Satyanand, and I greet everyone as President of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs, a New Zealand-wide organisation with a national office in Wellington and eight regional branches. The Institute has a proud record of gathering and promoting interest in international relations and their effect on New Zealanders during the last 80 years or more. I'm flanked at this desk this afternoon by Chris Seed, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and by Dame Winnie Laban. In the Institute's program of speeches, discussions, publications, and programs, that program is now delivered in person and in writing, as well as online and in social media. This afternoon's event features an important engagement by the country's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta, a senior member of the present government in her ministerial position since last year, 2020, and who has been in parliament since the mid 1990s. The minister's centerpiece is entitled New Zealand's Pacific Engagement, Partnering for Resilience. Introducing her and functioning as moderator will be another well-known and respected New Zealander, Assistant Vice-Chancellor Pacifica of the Victoria University of Wellington, Associate Professor Lua Manuvao Winnie Laban, herself a former Member of Parliament. Tena Korua, Nga Mihi o Te Ahiai, Talofo Talofa Telelava. Dame Winnie, may I leave things in your hands. <clears throat> A te nā tātou katoa, e te minitā o te manatū, aurere, he rangatira me wahine toa, tēnā koe nanaia. Nau mai haere mai ki tēnei huinga, whakatau mai ki runga ki te kaupapo o te rā, nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. E mō mō te whatuloa tūlipa i a lasi lasi o a whatasi mai. Whatalo, whalawa, lo minister, nanaia mahuta. Matato tinga te Pasifika. Uh, good day, true. Kam nā Māori. Uh, Mālo lanei and very warm Pacific greetings in all the sacred languages that our people represent. I also wanted to, to thank and welcome everyone who have joined us with our minister this afternoon, to our guests who are here as part of this virtual forum. It is indeed my great pleasure and honor to introduce the Honorable Nanaya Mahuta, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Aotearoa, New Zealand. The minister's tribal affiliations are to Waikato Tainui, Ngati Maniapoto, and Ngati Manu. In 2020, as part of the Labour government, the Honourable Mahuta became the first woman and first Wahine Māori, Māori woman, to hold the key foreign affairs portfolio. She is also the Minister of Local Government, and the Associate Minister for Māori Development. The Minister is the constituent MP for the Hodaki electorate with over 20 years experience serving her communities both at home and across Aotearoa. It is this richness and depth of experience working with people from all walks of life that we see in her approach to the foreign affairs portfolio and to the Pacific relationship. That is recognizing the mana and sovereignty of individual nations and in her work, reinforcing whakapapa and ngafa and genealogy of our region, our whanaungatanga, our wantok and our family and connections that we share as brothers and sisters in our region, the Pacific. Minister, we are so pleased to shortly hear your vision and keynote address 
reflecting New Zealand's approach to our critical and primary relationship with the Pacific. I know that this vision reflects your kōrero and talanoa and talk with our Pacific communities and has been key in shaping our way forward together. And that we are one diverse Pacific family linked by our ocean, te moana nui a kiwa. So for those of you tuning in today, we'll take your questions that should be submitted through the Q&A button along the bottom of your screen. In the interest of the ministers and all participants' time, please understand if we group questions rather than try to come to each one separately, that's fine. But we'll go with the flow of the Pacific. So, Minister, I have much honour in introducing you to your whānau. Thank you. Tangaroa wai nui, tangaroa wai rua. Nau ko te hōhunu, nau ko te ngaru ngaru. Nau ko te marino, nau te haunui a o tātou tūpuna i te moana nui ākiwa. Tangaroa te wai ora, tangaroa te wai tapu e. Whano, whano tū mai e te hoi, haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. E ai ki te kōrero whakapū mautia ngaiwi i tō rātou a ke mana. He mana tuku iho, he mana motuhake, he mana whakahaere. He mana nō te moana nui ākiwa. Nō reira tēnā koutou, malo e la lei, talofa lava, ni sambula bula vanaka taloha ni, whakalofa lahi atu, kia ora na. And warm Pacific greetings to you all today. Thank you to Seanan Sachinan for hosting this event and also to the Honourable Lua Manaval Dame Winnie Laban for moderating our forum today. This is an opportunity to share the next steps that I, intake, I intend to take to reinforce the centrality of the Pacific and our outlook over the next few years. Aotearoa New Zealand draws its whakapapa connection from Polynesia and our whanaungatanga reinforces our special relationship to Te Moana Nui Akiwa, the Blue Ocean continent. Our voyaging legacy of our Polynesian forebears is a story of endurance and resilience. Our recent history also connects us to the United Kingdom, the early establishment of government in New Zealand and the Treaty of Waitangi Te Tiriti or Waitangi as our founding document. We have the advantage of drawing from our Pacific and founding ancestors to shape our relationship to and with the Pacific. But first, let me take a moment to share a whakatauki that is a metaphor well understood across the Pacific. Kapu te ruha ka hao te rangatahi. As the old net is cast aside, the new net goes fishing. When we consider the importance of the moana and its resources of the marine environment, Fishing is a vital activity to ensure the survival of people and communities. The net is an enduring symbol of the resilience of people to sustain themselves. The imagery of the old and the new net convey intergenerational knowledge passing on. Consider elders, komata and kuia, reinforcing connection, identity and knowledge through the active practices of traditions such as fishing, weaving, sustainable harvesting, understanding the natural environment and caring for whānau, then we begin to gain an appreciation for the endurance and resilience of the Pacific people and their culture. This has been an extraordinary period where a global pandemic has disrupted our way of life in so many ways. We're meeting on a virtual platform and increasingly we've had to change the way we participate in forums to share our perspectives. But just as we have shaped our response to COVID and the uncertainty it has created, we've adapted and continue to move towards creating the new normal way of life. Today, I wanted to share how Aotearoa New Zealand will build on the Pacific reset towards a Pacific resilience approach and why. Our connection to the Pacific is reflected through language, peoples, ocean, history, culture, politics, and shared interests. Together, we share kaitiaki responsibilities for the Moana Nui Akiwa, the Blue Ocean continent. This concept is enduring and intergenerational. 
What we do for our children today sets the course for our tamariki and mokopuna tomorrow. When we consider livelihoods, we speak to intergenerational perspectives. The centrality of the Pacific for Aotearoa means our common stance to ensure a peaceful, stable, prosperous and resilient Pacific where Aotearoa New Zealand is seen as a partner. As we navigate our engagement in the region across our foreign policy, trade development and our security partnerships, we need to draw on all the tools available in our kite to support our way forward. The reset was a deliberate decision by the government to focus on the Pacific and our world outlook. The reset acknowledged that New Zealand's priority and future is linked to the Pacific and therefore we have a key interest in a safe, secure and prosperous region. Security within the region relies on strong relationships. The approach recognised the importance of partnership between Aotearoa and Pacific nations and the reset gave coherence and focus to more than 30 government agencies working with Pacific neighbours. This in turn sought to bolster the influence of like-minded partners in the region. It also acknowledged that the region is facing an array of challenges and changes, social, environmental, security and economic, and this hasn't changed. In fact, the arrival of COVID-19 across our globe has severely hindered the progress for some Pacific Island nations. As those at COP26 are currently highlighting, climate change remains the single biggest threat to the region. But COVID has exasperated issues of equality and need, setback development gains, and highlighted the importance of support that delivers sustainable results. The move towards a resilience focus is a natural next step as we look at how to respond to the significant challenges of the here and now, founded on an authentic and values-based Pacific way. Now is the time to do so. COVID has stressed the region's level of vulnerability and need to shift towards meaningful and transformative change that supports greater economic, social, and environmental resilience. It has also taught us many lessons, learnings from what hasn't worked, as well as how integrated partnerships can strengthen resilience. Our approach to health and governance during the pandemic is a clear example of this. At the request of Pacific partners, we've responded quickly to provide support for economies, health systems, and social wellbeing. Our contributions have helped with pandemic preparedness, PPE supply, hospital upgrades, testing ass assistance, medical equipment, isolation and quarantine facilities, and even the deployment of medical teams we have requested. Aotearoa has been able to provide emergency economic support to help Pacific Island countries to meet their critical budget needs, respond directly to their individual needs, and work to their own priorities. We've provided 201.3 million in emergency budget support to Pacific nations since the start of the pandemic. Our strong health to health linkages with Polynesian countries in particular meant that we were able to act quickly to support pandemic planning and vaccination rollout. The Polynesian Health Corridors Programme has been an important vehicle for this assistance. And I want to acknowledge Associate Minister for Pacific Health, Opita William Seal, for the work he is doing in this space. We have an opportunity to learn from these interactions to apply our wider engagement. But we must also look at the next steps as we move from emergency response to recovery. In that engagement, we want to encourage others, states, economies, multilateral institutions, non-governmental organizations and community groups towards relationships that will strengthen Pacific aspirations. We want to acknowledge that building long-term resilience across the region requires an integrated approach as a collective. We have a significant Pacific population who have chosen Aotearoa as their home. 
One in 10 New Zealanders will identify as being of Pacific heritage by 2026. Those who live here actively contribute to their ancestral homelands in a number of ways. I believe that we can engage Pacific diaspora communities in different ways to support broader objectives across the region. As we recognize, build, maintain and strengthen our connections to the Pacific, we do so based on respect for the mana of each nation. Mana holds a value that is reflected in the quality of the relationship rather than its frequency. It holds an enduring and even intergenerational quality that is reinforced through people to people connections. And if we get it right, may even extend to countries and governments. Mana is not subservient and neither can it be taken for granted. Instead, it is a series of engagements that strengthen the quality of the relationship. And this can be fostered as a distinctive component of our diplomatic relationships in the region. Mana is also a measure of action beyond words. Every year we prepare for the cyclone season because we understand how catastrophic these significant weather events can be on the livelihoods of whānau and communities across the Pacific. Our relationships across the Pacific need to be founded in openness, trust and respect. We're all committed to the best outcome for the region together. This principle enables us to engage in open communication and highlights the necessity of listening to understand different perspectives. Our engagement must be as partners. Each country has a different starting point and there won't be a one size fits all approach. We must listen to work together for the greater region's strategic good. Our Pacific partners also expect Aotearoa to be consistent and reliable when it matters most. How we engage in this challenging time, where competition in the region is greater than it has ever been before, will be key to many of our relationships. Regional architecture must draw its strength from a Pacific way that seeks to establish rules and norms embedded, embedded in Polynesian tikanga and Pacific-led solutions. Kotahitanga is a value that can support shared advocacy of regional priorities and a New Zealand perspective. Our international development cooperation, cooperation supports our partners' determination, or mana motuhake, to chart their own development path, pathways. With the Sustainable Development Goals as our common horizon, supporting SDG outcomes across the Pacific at this time also furthers climate change objectives, which is a priority for the region. We're working to accompany our partners on their journey to achieving the SDGs they prioritise. At the same time, we're providing targeted support to build the capability of Pacific countries and the region more broadly to measure and report against the SDGs. As extreme weather events intensify, sea level <clears throat> rises and temperatures increase, the economic and non-economic costs of climate change are becoming increasingly apparent. For our part, New Zealand is taking action to reduce global emissions, ensure a fair and equitable transition of our economy and build climate resilience both at home and abroad. I want to acknowledge our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and Minister for Climate Change James Shaw. They have stewarded through the important decisions that align our domestic focus and signalled the readiness for COP26 and our international commitments. We have a responsibility to advocate for greater ambition, which will also support Pacific nations who are already disproportionately impacted by the actions of developed nations. Finance for adaptation is key for helping the Pacific avert and address these impacts. At least half of New Zealand's new 1.3 billion climate finance commitment will go to supporting the Pacific and at least half for adaptation. This is more than four times the size of our 2018 commitment of 300 million. New Zealand's national circumstances and emissions profile present opportunity and challenge for reducing emissions. I'm mindful that our ambition to work with the Pacific on climate related impacts links strongly to a resilience focus. Building on this pathway, we support approaches 
that aid a circular economy, where our Pacific partners have enhanced capacity to deliver on their national and regional priorities in sustainable environmental, economic and social development. These priorities are underpinned by, but go beyond, building resilience to climate change impacts. Our international development cooperation will support achievement of the full range of these resilience objectives and priorities. I anticipate that development cooperation delivered through this resilience framework and seeded in a partnership approach will shift the focus towards transformative impact. I'm committing Aotearoa to a resilience framework with the Pacific, one that builds into generational resilience across all areas, the economy, the planet and people. As we start to look beyond the ongoing crisis response, we need to plan for a secure future with partnership at the centre of our approach. Pacific economies in particular have been stressed by COVID. COVID has disrupted our economies, closed borders, caused a shutdown of tourism activity and constrained labour flows to fulfil RSC arrangements. Pre-COVID, tourism generated a New Zealand 5.6 billion for Pacific economies and nearly half a million New Zealanders visited the region in 2019, second only to Australia. The pandemic has urged us to work towards economic integration in key areas to support an economic recovery and long-term resilience. Labour mobility, infrastructure, education and skills training are important areas for further partnering. PESA Plus, with its potential for 3.1 billion in two-way trade, may well help to pivot into this resilience frame, and I look forward to supporting Minister Twyford in the work he is leading in this area. When it comes to our planet, strong regional cooperation is essential for continued kaitiakitanga, sustainable conservation. That includes management of our region's shared fisheries resources. A long-term commitment to respond to illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing in our region is key to supporting the region's sustainable development. Working with Pacific partners to support the declaration on preserving maritime zones in the face of climate change related sea level rise to the global stage. Through the Pacific Islands Forum also demonstrates our commitment to the issues that matter most for the region. On people, we align our contribution to supporting the capability and capacity across the Pacific. I want to thank you, Dame Luamanuval Winnie Laban, for the work of the Pacific Public Service Fully to support government administration across the Pacific nations. And it's one, of, one example of strategic alignment to focus on public sector excellence. We understand the importance of leadership and excellence across the public sector and are keen to offer support where we can. Another example is our work with MPI to provide peer-to-peer -peer support to build fisheries management capacity in the region. Our approach and resourcing will be across the breadth of New Zealand's engagement to make the best use of government agencies, civil society, business and industry, regional organisations and other partners. Agencies such as Customs, Immigration, New Zealand Police and Aviation Security have long-standing relationships with their Pacific counterparts. We'll work to embed Pacific cultural frameworks in our work, including by strengthening cultural competence and regional awareness. If we're truly to step over the threshold of the old way to the new way when taking a strengths and opportunity based approach, this is a new conversation space in our relationship. In short, our confidence to find a new way is core to the resilience approach that I'm promoting. To help with this, I've set out some principles which will guide our engagement with the region. Tatai Hono, the recognition of deep and enduring whakapapa connections. Tato Tato, all of us working collectively together towards shared outcomes. Fire Te Taumata Ohanga, our journey towards a circular economy and looking towards that intergenerational benefit. Turo Hawaii, navigating the, the difficult and complex challenges of this time together. 
Arongia Kirangiatia, a focus towards excellence and our shared capacity to work together towards this end. I'm also keen to ensure that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade will consider implications for Pacific and potential for the Pacific and potential overlap in domestic policy objectives. An example of this is language revitalization and the aspiration to ensure that the role we play here in Aotearoa can deliver a mutually reinforcing benefit back to the Pacific. I'm asking the ministry to embed Pacific cultural frameworks in the approach we take in working with Pacific partners. We do this by investing in the Pacific diversity of our organization building our cultural competence and ensuring that knowledge of the Pacific is core to the training of our workforce, our ambassadors, our diplomatics teams. How we project who we are as a country and the centrality of the Pacific means more staff need to work in and understand the Pacific region. And that will have a doubling positive impact as they go out across the world. A partnered approach for resilience also means encouraging impactful co-investment from actors outside the region and promoting Pacific priorities and Pacific ownership in our approach to cooperation. We need to find other opportunities that leverage economic, social, cultural and environmental advantage with Pacific partners. And I know we can't do this alone. Australia is an important partner to help us achieve this objective, to work alongside us as a partner. We'll also work with and crowd in a range of partners to build resilience by promoting Pacific priorities, Pacific ownership and the Pacific way. Let me return to the metaphor of kapu te ruha ka hau te rangatahi. With regards to the net, much of what I have outlined should look and feel familiar the tradition of net making has some consistent principles in their design. However, through the generations, the way a net is set or cast can differ according to the location tied, whether it is being set from land or sea, and of course, determined by what you are setting out to catch. The, the Pacific Reset was very much focused on the net, reaffirming the importance of the relationship with the Pacific was its main purpose. A Pacific resilience focus is about learning how to utilize the net for maximum benefit, leveraging the Pacific partnership for intergenerational impact. The time is right for Aotearoa New Zealand's Pacific engagement to move from reset to resilience. Resilience in the way that I intend is a Pacific centric view of our collective interests in the region, shifting us to a strengths based approach that acknowledges building long-term resilience requires an ecosystem-wide response. Aotearoa New Zealand sits within that ecosystem. The urgent and complex challenges facing our region are far greater than any of our differences. And I believe our strength and success to overcome these relies on the countries of the Blue Pacific Ocean continent. Listening to each other, acting together, feeling like we're hearing one another. Asserting our ambition for a peaceful, secure and prosperous Pacific region is vitally important. I look forward to continuing to work with our partners to build long-term resilience across the region and to realize our shared goals. I also look forward to 2022 in the hope of extending my engagement as foreign minister, hopefully to in-person meetings. Noreda in ending, I reiterate a, a statement of resilience from my ancestors. E kore e ngaro, he kākano i duia mai i rangiatea. One will not be lost as they are received, cast forth from rangiatea. Nō reira, kei ngā iti, kei ngā rahi, te nā koutou, te nā koutou katoa. Kora, Minister, thank you very, very much for that very visionary speech. And it's very much anchored in the terms and the values that you were shared in Te Reo Māori. Uh, to acknowledge, you know, the centrality of the Pacific linked to Whakapapa and Whanaungatanga, that we have an ancient connection that feeds your metaphor of the net and the importance of all of us working collectively together to support all of our people 
uh, to rise up, but also live with mana and dignity. Uh, thank you very much for sharing the strands of the net with your vision, which is about economic, it's about social, it's about cultural in our languages. It's also about our environment and how we can all work together on the themes that you've talked about, the themes of resilience, uh, the true measure of partnership, the importance of peace and security, a public service fale that is relevant and appropriate to our context, to climate change and to COVID, and how can we sustain each other so all of our people and our children can live with dignity, not only from the past into the present and to the future and to peace. So thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'm sure all of our people in the region, all that are here because it is our home, will be very encouraged. So I will now move to questions and um, questions. And we will start with two video questions, please, from the Pacific region. And then we have a number of questions that have come from our virtual audience, please, Minister. And uh, the first question will come via video clip uh, from Dr. Manu Matavai Dupo Ruzin, Director General of the Forum Fisheries Agency. Our leaders have underlined climate change as the single greatest threat to our people. The science estimates that there will be an impact on our valuable tuna resources, both in terms of abundance and distribution. With a proportion moving to the east and to the high seas, most notably after 2050. A recent study states that the potential implications for Pacific Island economies in 2050 includes an average annual loss in regional tuna fishing access fees of 90 million US dollars and reductions in government revenue of up to 13% for individual Pacific seas. What can New Zealand do to assist Pacific Island countries in seeking climate justice? Thank you, Dr. Manu, for the uh, question. And uh, when we last had this conversation, it was very clear uh, that we needed to uh, ensure that we took a uh, science-based, evidence-based approach to understand what was happening with the fishery stock, and I'm pleased that we're supporting uh, that. I'm also uh, pleased that we continue to support uh, the fisheries forum uh, around illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, uh, which will be uh, vitally important as fish migrate uh, eastwards uh, into international waters. And it seems to me the opportune time, which is why I mentioned uh, the uh, focus of climate finance being invested into the Pacific, that this is an area uh, of uh, focus that uh, may well uh, be a part of our uh, climate finance uh, further support uh, to the particular issues that you've raised. There's no doubt uh, that we can and must do more. There's no doubt. Uh, and uh, with the leadership of the forum, uh, the ability to bring uh, much of that information back to the Pacific Island Forum so that there's greater visibility on what can be done, uh, I know that there's a pathway uh, to agree to address uh, many of the issues that you've raised. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, we now invite the Pacific Visibility Forum from Fiji. I'll read the question. Okay. So the question from, from the forum is this, the Pacific Disability Forum. Our Minister, how will your government ensure that investment made in the region post-COVID is inclusive of persons with disabilities and their representative organisations, that they are consulted and supported meaningfully? Again, this is an area where I, I am, am uh, hopeful that we can uh, continue to do more. Uh, what we've learned is that with COVID and with climate change, there is a very real risk if we are not vigilant about how we provide support that there will be gaps 
for the most vulnerable. And I, I will say that people with disabilities uh, are often uh, a, a part of a group that's identified as being in the most vulnerable. I'm pleased with some of the work uh, that we have been uh, investing in that the uh, Pacific Disability Forum is an area uh, that has helped to encourage greater inclusion uh, and that through our COVID relief uh, and response, we've also supported uh, disability issues. Uh, again, if I think about the intergenerational challenge uh, and the, the way in which we consider uh, working with uh, dis, uh, dis, the disability sector across the Pacific, I'm hopeful uh, that uh, the messages that we've sent uh, to uh, our partner organisations that are working in the Pacific, that they too will bring greater visibility and effort to address disability issues with the work that they're doing. On to other questions that have come through. Uh, the first question is from Stephen Ratuva. It's about reset to resilience. The question is, is the resilience approach an extension of reset or replaces reset? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's an extension of, I mean, what, what, as I said in, in the speech, the reset was an opportunity to send uh, a, a very clear signal that the Pacific is important to New Zealand and that we are reorienting uh, our efforts, especially in terms of coordination across government agencies to ensure that we can do a lot more uh, as a government to align uh, to uh, the aspirations in the Pacific. Why, we, why it's a good um, platform to build on is that we've got a great many challenges now impacting on the Pacific and we cannot take a short-term approach. And it is important that we start to embed a resilience framework in the way that we intend to partner with the Pacific and in the way that we consider some of the substantial cha challenges facing the Pacific, like climate change. I think that uh, uh, reorients uh, the, the way in which we, again, invest and partner with the Pacific towards some of those medium to longer term outcomes, but it also sets a very firm uh, impression about uh, the nature of the relationship, the strength of it continuing to build on the relationship and partnerships with the Pacific. And, and in my mind, uh, once we have uh, a commitment to that framework, such as what I'm proposing, uh, greater coordination across the government sector uh, and the way in which we are developing our uh, plans uh, around uh, IDC, uh, aid investment and then climate finance that will back up and bolster a resilience focus. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, the next question is the theme is economic development from Jordan. What role could New Zealand play in lifting the economic development potential of Pacific nations? What would good look like in terms of progress in the next couple of years? Well, I think ultimately that is a question for Pacific nations to, to um, uh, initiate uh, a conversation and, and I say that carefully because what we have seen as a result of uh, COVID closed borders, uh, those nations who have been heavily reliant on tourism, that there is a need for greater diversification across uh, their economy. The role that New Zealand could play uh, if we take a resilience uh, approach is one where we might be extended to, we might be asked to think beyond uh, uh, the, tr the, the, tr the traditional aid kind of and support frame. For example, uh, what is the benefit of engaging in uh, broader research collaborations with the Pacific to, su uh, to support their aspiration of diversifying economic opportunity? What would that look like? Uh, uh, in terms of uh, those nations who are thinking about adding value uh, to what they produce, how might technology play its part? And is there an opportunity there for New Zealand to assist, again, to add value uh, to uh, 
what uh, they are sending to market. Again, I think potentially uh, the uh, further conversations through PACER Plus might bring out uh, some of this, uh, uh, this opportunity and initiate a different conversation with New Zealand. Um, I, again, I, I, I don't want to um, try and articulate that, but I want to signal that a resilience focus would mean New Zealand would need to be prepared to have a, a range of different conversations with the Pacific around the substantial challenge uh, that they have uh, to diversify their economy and to meet some significant pressures because of COVID and uh, compounded by climate change is the reality that they're facing. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, the next question is the theme is geopolitics with China. The participant is Trisha, and her question is, how is the government responding to the increasing presence of China in the Pacific? Well, I gave, uh, many of you may have heard the uh, earlier speech that I gave uh, around uh, the Tanifa and the, and the dragon. And uh, in that speech, I certainly highlighted that the nature of New Zealand's relationship with China was one that was respectful, predictable and consistent. Uh, and that we were recognising the assertion uh, of uh, China within our uh, region and across the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, the uh, relationship that we have is such that we, uh, it's based on a no surprises. Uh, we are very uh, clear around the things that we can work together on. And we are cre increasingly becoming very clear about the things uh, that we uh, do not and cannot agree with. And mu much of those issues are in the human rights space. In saying that, uh, we've also reflected that it is a concern uh, in terms of the way in which investment in the Pacific is occurring uh, and uh, creating uh, quite a significant uh, level of economic vulnerability and debt. Uh, and that is uh, an area that creates its own complexities. Uh, so the resilience focus enables us to talk to like-minded uh, partners who want to partner with the Pacific for those medium to long term opportunities to bolster a Pacific way, a Pacific uh, vision for itself. And that is a new conversation space uh, that I think we can contribute to with a level of uh, uh, and authenticity, um, because it's a, an approach that we understand well in New Zealand. I'm not saying we've got it perfect, but it's an approach that we understand and, and that is necessary. Um, if I step back, uh, there is, uh, without a doubt, uh, 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 a reality that we are all having to observe uh, that the whole of the Indo-Pacific region is now becoming quite a strategic area where big powers are now uh, exercising their, their, their influence and interest. Uh, but I come back home uh, and, and, and I say home literally to my Polynesian uh, Pacific roots to say that we are stronger together when we articulate our aspirations for ourselves with a very clear view that the benefits that transpire from our vision of a strong, stable, secure, peaceful and prosperous Pacific is embedded in that Pacific way. And we have to, I guess, use the regional architecture of the Pacific, like the forum, uh, and, and uh, the conversations that we have within the forum to uh, step forward and out and towards the vision that we want to create for the Pacific region. And that is a, a strong starting place uh, or a strong foundation to move from. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the next question is the theme is AUKUS, regional politics. Participants are Peter and Suzanne. The question is, what do you see as the implications of the new AUKUS arrangement for the Pacific and your emphasis on the importance of listening and recognising the cultural orientation of local communities? I think those arrangements uh, are, are very much arrangements that uh, 
uh, Australia, the UK and US have identified as beneficial uh, to uh, bolstering uh, uh, their cooperation uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, without a doubt, uh, that uh, must be observed uh, by uh, the Pacific is, is very, um, uh, a very relevant um, and significant move. We welcome interest in our region uh, and the overriding uh, ambition for our region extending across the Indo-Pacific reflected by ASEAN partners is that a more peaceful, prosperous, stable region is in our shared interests. And, we, and I, I absolutely agree with that outlook that's been expressed across the ASEAN group. Uh, for the Pacific in particular, uh, again, I come back to my former comment is that we, it is very important at this time that the cohesion of the Pacific, the way in which the Pacific Island Forum can help articulate that cohesion is a very uh, important forum uh, to be able to um, project out how we would like things to uh, be working within our, within our part of the world. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the next question is the theme is regional relationships from Guy Fitty Sinclair. What place do regional organisations have in this vision? Given the recent challenges faced by the forum, how does New Zealand plan to support these organisations as a means of fostering and empowering partners in the region? Uh, if I can... Uh... And, and forgive me if I've misunderstood the question, but if, if the forum is the Pacific Island Forum uh, and, and the regional architecture and what we can do, we support the regional architecture to be able to project and discuss issues that are of importance to the Pacific region. In terms of the current challenge before the forum, in particular in relation to the Micronesian states, we continue to encourage a united approach. And we do that uh, uh, with uh, across the Polynesian uh, part of the uh, forum, as well as Micronesian, Melanesian uh, groupings as well. Ultimately, uh, we must see our mutual benefit, our shared benefit in working together. And I would hope uh, that uh, the time that we have before us to continue to reinforce the strength that the strength of a cohesive Pacific Island Forum far outweighs the differences that have emerged uh, in the immediate uh, past. And, and I know that there are like-minded uh, leaders across uh, our various uh, countries to be able to continue to promote that approach. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the last question is from Connection, Patai Hono, Richard Jeffries. Do you see greater opportunities for Māori to work more closely with our cousins from Te Moana Nui Akiwa in partnership as part of your ministry support to our region, Pacific? Uh, yes, I do. I do. And I think that... There are aspects of that partnership that can be very fruitful. If I think about Māori economic resilience and the profile of the Māori economy, there are very niche areas that would, uh, I think, um, help support, but also be mobilised by uh, that Pacific fusion. Uh, and if I... Uh, again, uh, consider what's transferable about uh, uh, what's happening in the Māori economy with the Pacific economy. It's that value add part of the equation. Māori have, uh, are able to share uh, much of what it has achieved in enhancing uh, economic opportunity and value through the use of technology, but also through partnerships and relationships. Uh, and, and that is an area where it would be easy to make a, a connect. Perhaps another area is in um, uh, governance and leadership, because uh, Polynesian society is what it is. 
there may well be a lot more uh, similarities around organising uh, tribal communities across the Pacific um, and then your local economy that falls off that. And that's another area where you can, um, it would be easy to see what some uh, natural connectors uh, could be between Polynesian countries and uh, New Zealand and Māori in particular. Thank you, Minister. Uh, there's another question that's come in, if you don't mind. Um, the theme is resilience and governance. And it's Ruben Azazan who has asked the question, as Minister of Local Government, what opportunities do you see to promote and support resilience and values based on governance in the Pacific? That's a really good question. Um, Hmm. Well, if I think about a uh, couple of things there, first, if I think about leading through change with local government around the full well-beings, uh, the, um, the disruptive, I guess, uh, role that that can play on participatory democracy and thinking about placemaking and the way in which uh, inclusion, uh, an inclusive uh, society can be achieved through democracy, um, but with a focus on the full well-being. So I think that's that's a real challenge. It's a challenge for New Zealand, but it's also an opportunity. We do need to uh, find ways that participatory democracy is a very well understood and well engaged with model, and perhaps there is something to be shared in that space. Uh, with Pacific partners. Uh, the other part element of that, and it is a challenge that we have still before us, but we have to, if we're moving towards greater social inclusion, then we are talking to those who feel the most disenfranchised as a citizen in our society at the local government level. And again, much of the uh, reform that I'm leading through around future for local government is around this concept and making real this concept of participatory democracy and social inclusion, reaching out to those who have been disenfranchised, disenfranchised young people, ethnic communities, uh, those, um, those who feel mistrust of a democratic system. Perhaps there's something there that we can uh, share uh, as we learn along the way. Thank you very much, Minister. So we're on to our last question, and I think it's quite a beautiful one. Uh, the theme is Pacific Diaspora, and the participant is Ambassador Peter Ryan from the United Nations, Tēnā koe Peter. How do you see the importance and role of the Pacific Diaspora in Aotearoa as partners for the government's work in the region? This is about listening and understanding. Uh, the Pacific diaspora communities in Aotearoa make a significant contribution to who we are as a country, there's, without a doubt. Uh, and, uh, and beyond sending remittances, which I might add was very strong during the COVID period back to their, uh, their mother countries, there is an, a strong ambition from our diaspora communities about some of those resilience challenges the survival of language because inherent in that is cultural practices and identity. Uh, the ability to have perhaps contribute towards um, uh, uh, how a Pacific way and democracy might fuse together. And there's, there's thoughts about that. Also, you know, just with the most recent uh, Talanoa that I've been hosting around uh, moving into a resilience frame, it's about how to build capacity within country rather than ex, uh, exporting it from New Zealand for a period of time and then pulling it out, you know. There's all this perspective that diaspora communities have because their hearts and passion are still in their homeland about how to do this in, in, in a way that is authentic, has an integrity and is committed to the, again, medium long term aspirations of their of their motherland and and I think we have a lot to learn we have a lot to learn within the ministry about 
how how to work and engage diaspora communities. Um, the, the thing that we could support, again, and I and, and I use languages as a very serious um, uh, opportunity space is the uh, continued revitalization and growth and of, of Pacific languages here in Aotearoa. Uh, because if we can if we can contribute to that if we can contribute to the creative sector, if we can contribute to how Pacific knowledge uh, can be uh, utilised here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, its contribution back potentially at some point in time to the Pacific has an exponential impact, exponential without a doubt. And uh, the reason why I bring this perspective uh, uh, to the response, but also to the approach that I'm taking is because uh, uh, there's so much vibrancy, there's so much talent, there's so much opportunity if we can mobilize the talents and use it in a way that has this doubling positive benefit uh, to the Pacific. And I think we've just got to listen, listen more and try and understand where those real gems of opportunities exist and, and work with it, not try and ignore it, that's for sure. We've got to work with it. Thank you, Minister, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for, for your vision. And it reminds us of the principles of the humanity and generosity of the peoples of the Pacific. I thank you for the net metaphor. Uh, it is about inclusion. It's acknowledging no matter how small a Pacific nation is or how large, our strength is in the ability to weave together uh, to ensure that everyone paddles their canoe. So thank you so much, uh, Minister. I am, um, and also for answering those questions with such clarity and thought and mana, which you've always had throughout your, your life and will continue to do so. So um, I want to now hand over to Sir Nan Sutanand to please close our event. Thank you, Dame Winnie. Honorable Minister, uh, to round things off, I have the task of first thanking you for delivering an important speech and to echo uh, Dame Winnie uh, to emphasize your generous and fulsome reaction uh, to the questions uh, that were raised uh, by people online. I secondly want to thank you, Dame Winnie, for lending your mana to this event. May I say that the reputation of the Institute as an independent catalyst and supporter of civil society interests in international relations has been enhanced uh, by this event. I want to thank everyone uh, for their attendance and participation. In closing, I make reference to the Institute's website which is an ongoing source of information and opinion for those interested in current events and the international scene. Kei ngā mihi atu, whawhetai lava, thank you and good afternoon. Noora mai, kia ora koutou. Kia ora.